Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What the kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He grants peace within your borders. He fills you with the finest of wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down hail like crumbs. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He makes his wind blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and ordinances to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his ordinances. Praise the Lord. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, the Creator of heaven and earth and everything in it, all powerful and yet all loving, merciful and gracious, the great I am. We come to you today with sincere thanksgiving for every good and perfect gift that you so freely give us the gifts of family and peace and health, and especially for the gift of your son Jesus, the, the perfect redeeming sacrifice for all our sins. We pray, Father, that you'll forgive our many sins and as we confess them and repent, and that we may always serve you by serving other people, that we may bow to you by exercising humility toward others and that we may truly love you with a love that leads us to love the other people and dear father in light of all the uncertainty and the unrest throughout the world today we ask for good health and for peace for everyone and may your spirit bring healing and comfort to all, especially to those that have lost life to illness or accident, and to those who've been devastated by uh, extreme poverty and poor health and by the terrible carnage of warfare. And Father, may the grip that Satan has on so many people today listened entirely by your spirit working in them and in us. And dear God, we pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to guide and support all of us here as we navigate the process of choosing shepherds for your Vandagi flock. We ask your continued blessings on all your family of believers in this neighborhood as we show the love of Jesus to everyone. And Father, as we live today and every day on this earth, we pray that everything we do and everything we say and everything that we even think and contrarily, everything that we don't do or don't say, or don't think, that they all bring honor and glory to your loving and forever gracious name. May we always be granted the blessed peace that surpasses our understanding, the peace that comes only through our wonderful Savior, Jesus the Christ, our Messiah, through whom we pray. Amen.
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, in the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the richness of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set up our hope in Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you had heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance toward redemption as God's own people, to the praise of his glory. Good morning or good afternoon. I hope you're doing well. Happy New Year. I'm recording this on January 1st, 2021, and I hope this finds you and your family and your friends happy, safe, and healthy as we start a new year together. Uh, today I'm going to be in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 7 through 14, and I will read that now. For thus says the Lord, Sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, and raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, Save, O Lord, your people, the remnant of Israel. See, I am going to bring them from the land of the north, and gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, those with child and those in labor together. A great company, they shall return here. With weeping, they shall come. And with consolations, I will lead them back. I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they shall not stumble. For I have become a father to Israel. And Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd, a flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from hands too strong for him. They shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion. And they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil. And over the young of the flock and the herd, their life shall become like a watered garden and they shall never languish again. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for what it shows us what it teaches us, how it shapes us, and how it forms us into a community uh, of your people. And we pray, Lord, that as we reflect on the Word made flesh uh, during these weeks of Christmas, that you help us understand how our life is a part of Jesus' life, how our life is different and transformed into something new, where we can point to your promises uh, made real, on this earth. Be with us as we hear your word this morning. Help it to strengthen us and comfort us, but help it also to challenge us, to teach us, to help us grow. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, if you've been like me and you've looked on the internet or social media at all, I'm sure you've seen many uh, articles about how 2020 was the worst year ever between uh, COVID between racial unrest, uh, between the political situation in our country, people have just decided to write off a whole year of their lives, 2020, as the worst year ever. 
it seems like we're people, uh, at least if you believe what you read on the internet, we're people who live in exile. Whether uh, you're an American, you're a rich American, poor American, um, black or white, we've all been affected by this year in a tough way. But as God's people, as we do live in exile, we live that exile out um, with a sense of uh, hope in God's future and in joy. And so those are the things I want us to reflect on today as we're looking at Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 7 through 14. And you got to think about the people who are hearing these words for the first time when they've been uh, given by Jeremiah. This is a group of migrants and refugees, people torn from homes and their homelands, people who have seen their loved ones die or even disappeared. This passage is written to a people who suffered at the hands of an empire's ruthless power. So the people listening to this are a people on the run and in fear for their lives. This text was probably written around the 6th century BCE, so about 600 years before Jesus was born, and just after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonian Empire. And so after years of warnings from Jeremiah and other prophets, disaster had finally befallen the kingdom. The city of Jerusalem was sacked, the temple destroyed, and the king and the court departed or dead. And the, deport, de, the, deporti, the deported people, the refugees who survived that journey from Jerusalem to Babylon, faced a new life in a foreign country. They faced movements and actions subject to a foreign power. Those orders given to them in a foreign language. So the people hearing Jeremiah's words, they had probably actually been settled in a refugee camp in rural Babylon, where they were expected to farm the land and pay taxes to the imperial government. So imagine being in the shoes of these people, torn away from your homeland, your loved ones dead or missing, relocated to a foreign country where you don't even speak anything like the language, and you're expected to live your life life out under the heel of this imperial government. Of course, if you look at the whole book of Jeremiah, these people that we meet in Jeremiah chapter 31 weren't the only people to suffer the pain of exile. The whole book of Jeremiah is a book of many refugees. It's a book of migrants. In Jeremiah chapter 6 and in Jeremiah chapter 35, we have the Benjamites, the, or excuse me, the Benjaminites and the Rechabites, two, two groups of Israelites who seek refuge in Jerusalem, hoping to avoid Babylonian onslaught. Of course, this doesn't work out the way they hope. And in Jeremiah chapter 40, the whole territory gets overrun and people flee across the Jordan River to Ammon, Moab, and Edom. Later on in Jeremiah chapter 41 through 43, Jeremiah himself goes to Egypt to flee Babylonian persecution. But the group he's with, they're divided over the cause of their trouble, but they're united in their decision that fleeing Jerusalem represents a better chance of surviving than staying put. So the whole book of Jeremiah is a book that responds to a world of people on the move and in exile. So when Jeremiah speaks a divine word to these people, God is attentive to the anxieties and concerns of these refugees and immigrants. These people, you have to understand, have gone through unspeakable suffering. But God has a new word for them in Jeremiah chapter 31. God will bring them home again. Even if they are scattered to the farthest parts of the earth, God will bring them home again. The joy this word evokes is so profound that it moves the people to tears. The pain and loss they have struggled with for so long will finally be brought to an end. God will deliver them and the relief is palpable. You 
can feel it oozing out of the text as you read it. Deliverance and restoration are here. And as Jeremiah describes what God is going to do for the people, he identifies God's motivation to action as a form of parental care. Look in verse 9. It says, I have become a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. God cares for the people like a parent cares for a child. This isn't some disconnected deity who is fickle and pleased by who knows what, but this is a God who deeply loves the people that God cares for. So therefore, since God cares for these people so much, the land to which the people will return is like Eden, like the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 1 through 3, Eden restored. Think about it. The last time these refugees saw their homeland, they saw Jerusalem and the land surrounding it, it was a devastated and war-torn wasteland. But now as God brings them home, the fields and the waterways of Israel's homeland are bursting with life and abundance. The grain, the wine, and the oil, the young of the flock, and the herd God is not going to send these traumatized people back into a war zone, but he's going to take them to a healthy homeland where safety will be assured. So imagine being in their shoes, sitting in Babylon, cultivating that foreign soil when you get this word from a prophet that God is going to do something new, that he's going to take you back home and you'll get to work your own land again, but it will be different than even you knew it before. So we have this whole text of people and refuge or people in exile, refugees who've experienced the worst longing for a day when this will all come to end, and then they get the news that it will, that God is doing that very thing. So what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us at Opl- or excuse me, at uh, uh, Vandalia Church of Christ in 2021? Are we refugees and exiles? Remember, I talked about this at the beginning, Google 2020. And you'll see that people are saying it's the worst year ever. And maybe it's hyperbole, but it has been hard for a lot of people. People have lost fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters, and children to this thing. People have been sick and they're still dealing with long-term consequences of that sickness, whether it's medical bills that they have to pay as a result of it, or whether it's um, symptoms that have continued long after the virus itself has gone its way. Other people have lost jobs. They've lost homes. They have no food. They're wondering, what in the world will this future look like? For others of us, life is not what it once was. We have words swirling around like social distancing. We wear masks while we're out. We're concerned about our health. Will we catch this thing? Other, others of us are fearful of government inaction, while others are fearful of government overreach. And even if we look at our church, we're not meeting together. We haven't in a long time. We're meeting apart. You're watching me on this screen instead of seeing me up front and then being able to talk to me after I'm done with this. So there's this question of what does the future hold for us? We feel unsettled. We do feel like we are refugees. Maybe not refugees from our country, but refugees from a time before covid wondering what's going to happen next. So maybe these words in Jeremiah chapter 31, maybe these words and these promises aren't just for those Israelites a couple thousand years ago, but they're for us as well. As God's children, God's promises of restoration and life apply to us. We sit in that refugee audience And we listen to a future described 
by Jeremiah, a future rooted in concrete hope. So as we think forward, when Jeremiah is describing this restoration and we're applying it to us today, let me be clear, this is not, let's have a good 2021. Jeremiah is saying something much more profound and deep than that. Jeremiah is saying that God will restore all things and God will make them right. God will make it so that there is no more injustice, so that there's no more sickness, so that there's no more inequality, that there's no more disease as God sets the world right through Jesus Christ. That is the ultimate hope that we have to look forward to. It's a future hope. It's not a, well, I hope 2021 is a little bit better. But we still have to ask, as the people of God and as Christians, what does 2021 look like for us? We live in exile, but as God's people, we live out restoration joy through Jesus Christ, the first fruits of this new life. So in 2021, if we're going to do that, our community, Vandalia Church of Christ, becomes a signpost an arrow that points to these ultimate promises, an outpost of the kingdom of God. Or maybe to use another illustration, if you've ever been to a gardening show, you'll see something called a demonstration plot, where they'll have a small plot of land where they've planted things in a certain way that they show you what the ideal looks like. The church is supposed to be a demonstration plot of the fullness of the kingdom of God where we live our lives in such a way that we point to an ultimate reality that God will make real in the future. So what does this mean? It means, especially if you look here at Jeremiah chapter 31, that moving forward to 2021, Vandalia Church of Christ, we have a robust communal identity where we lean on each other and we love each other. We become a place, Vandalia Church of Christ is a place of radical hospitality where we welcome the stranger, the orphan, the widow, the alien, the outcast. And not only do we welcome them, but we also provide healing and comfort for them as well. Vandalia Church of Christ in 2021 is a place that lacks the divisions of this world, whether it's political divisions, divisions over race, divisions over sexuality, divisions over socioeconomic levels in the kingdom of God. As Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, there's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, but all are one in Christ Jesus. And we, as a Vandalia Church of Christ in 2021, we can live out that reality in our church. And finally, as you look in in um, Jeremiah chapter 31, you see this picture of abundance, healing, and care. Beginning in verse 12, they shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion, and they shall be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, and the oil, and over the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall become like a watered garden, and they shall never languish again. Then shall the young women rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will give the priests their fill of fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my bounty, says the Lord. Look at that picture. How can we embody that in the coming year to be a community of abundance, a community of healing, a community of care, a community of rejoicing? So as you're going this week, continue this conversation at home and among each other. What stands out to me especially is at the end of verse 12. Their life shall become like a watered garden, and they shall never languish again. What does it mean for your life to be like a watered garden, especially in West Texas of all places? What does it mean that we never languish again? It's one thing to say, man, I hope 2021 is better but the question i think that this text has for us is not only how can we be intentional about making a better year coming forward but more importantly how can we be intentional about making god's promises for the future a reality in our community that point others 
to the fullness of life in Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we're thankful for your word and we're thankful for the words of Jeremiah. We're thankful for your promises and we ask, Lord, that you give us the courage not only to hope in them, but to seek to live those things out. I honestly cannot fully believe that we made it to 2021. What a crushing year 2020 was. While the new year often brings a sense of hopeful expectation, I know the turning of the year doesn't automatically change, well, anything. The pandemic still rages, people are still very sick. Millions of people around the world have died, including hundreds of our neighbors here in Lubbock. Racial and socioeconomic injustice still exist. Political divides are still deep and oftentimes painful. Millions are struggling with feelings of isolation. Mental health has deteriorated. Jobs and livelihoods have been lost or indefinitely put on hold. After all the loss, grief, and suffering of 2020, it can seem as if God is silent. When we do not hear God's voice amidst the suffering, it can feel as if God has abandoned us. For me, this is where the season of Advent and Christmas bring a helpful structure for our grief and doubt. We have weeks where we proclaim that we are drowning in darkness and are in need of light, that our suffering is great and we are in need of a savior, that we are weak and need a source of strength. And in response, we have tangible expressions of God's presence, candles that increase their light in the darkness with each coming week, hopeful anticipation of a baby that is Emmanuel, God with us right here. God showing us that real strength comes in the form of a helpless baby, that vulnerability and dependence on the love and support of others is what we are created for. Even he needed his mother. I don't know how many of you know that Mark and I struggled with infertility and miscarriages for a few years before we had Margot. The heartache and grief were isolating and unbearable at times. It was during this time, though, that the Christmas story began to resonate for me in deep ways. I began to understand more fully the deep longing of waiting and hope for something good to arrive. And then we are blessed with sweet Margot, followed by sweet Isla and sweet Benjamin, who are incredible gifts from God, tangible expressions of God's goodness and love. And I saw once again the pattern of the kingdom of God, death, absence, darkness, turn to life, presence, and light. Or maybe rather, life, presence, and light are always present, even when all we can see are death, absence, and darkness. Resurrection from death is the Christian promise. We see it all around us in nature. Spring comes after winter. Rotting vegetables turn to compost and feed our fields. Mourning turns to dancing in its season. The answered promises are often not what we expect, but resurrection is our story, always. This past year, I have spent a lot of time meditating on the image of God as our mother, especially as I have spent countless sleepless hours caring for my own baby Benjamin. God as mother is not an image that is often highlighted in our Christian language, but it is rooted in the Bible. As I have grieved and struggled in 2020, I have returned again and again to this image. God swaddling me as I struggle through pain and discomfort. God feeding me and keeping me warm. God gently rocking me and helping me rest. God tenderly singing a lullaby. God wiping away my messes without anger or frustration at me, just doing it because that's part of what it means to be a parent. God delighting in me as I reach new milestones. God smiling, not because I have done anything to earn it, but because God is my mother and loves me. This meditation has helped me to see that what I experience as God's silence is not absence, but instead it is intimacy. Just as I do not make a huge fuss when Benjamin cries out in the night, but quietly take care of him, so God enters into our distress and tenderly cares for us, holding us, rocking us, loving us. Today, as we take our communion together, may we find closeness with one another and with God. And if that is not our story right now, may we find the strength to rely on others to show us God's tender love for us. 
I want to pray this prayer written by Cole Arthur Riley, who writes daily prayers on Instagram under the profile Black Liturgies. If you don't follow her, you should. Pray with me. God who stays, it is difficult to believe that there is love in your silence. We have been conditioned by a world which tends to use its voice on behalf of the powerful and ignore the marginalized. So when we hear silence from you, it can feel like abandonment. Keep us from believing the lie that you have left us. Restore our experiences of silence, that it might be a space of rest and healing for us, that we would know that the presence of God is not confined to sound or silence, but that the holy good dwells within both in unique ways. And as we're tempted to believe our faith is impoverished for not always hearing you, help us to experience an intimacy and tenderness is the holy quiet of you. That we would believe in a kind of silence that isn't punishment or neglect, but a presence that is so close to our pain, you refuse to rush to words when what we most need is space to be still and heal. We pray this in the name of our Lord. Amen. We bless you, Abba Father, for you have visited your people in one like us in all things but sin, and in human fragility you have revealed the face of divinity. Gather into your arms all the peoples of the world, so that in your embrace we may find blessing, peace, and the fullness of our inheritance as your daughters and sons. Amen.